welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Uh, my name is Scott Barker, and thanks for joining us uh, for the next roughly hour or so. Uh, super excited for this conversation today. Uh, today, we're talking all about work-life balance, uh, how to live your best life uh, in sales. It's a topic we probably don't talk enough about, um, and it's a, it's a good one. We all, if you've been in sales more than you know, a few months, uh, we know it can be taxing. There's a lot of ups and downs, so uh, this is something that's near and dear to, to my heart, so I'm excited to jump into it. And we have an amazing guest uh, joining us today uh, who I've been uh, excited to, to chat to since we uh, had a conversation last week. Uh, I am joined by Adnan Chaudhry. Adnan, welcome to uh, the community. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, very excited to chat with you. So Adnan is the SVP of commercial sales over at Salesforce. And before I, I get you to add a little color there, uh, just want to take care of a few housekeeping items. So uh, Everyone, this will be recorded. So if you have to jump off, you got to run into a meeting or you want to share this out with one of your colleagues, uh, don't worry. We'll have this in your inbox uh, in a few hours after we wrap up. Uh, and number two is please, you know, get engaged. Uh, we want to hear from you. This conversation that we're having is very much for the community. So uh, jump on if you have any clarifying questions or, or want to pick Adnan's brain or my brain about anything, uh, please use the, the Q&A box. But anyway, we've got that out of the way. Um, Adnan, you have such a cool story. Um, you know, we, we had a conversation last week as we were prepping for this, this webinar, and I, I would love it if you could just tell us a little bit, you know, about yourself, because you've had such an amazing story rising to, you know, one of the most coveted and esteemed positions in sales, right? You're at Salesforce. You guys have been driving the the sales conversation and, and best practices forward for many years now. You got it. You got it. Well, before I kick off, um, let me just, I mean, it, it's great to actually talk about a topic both I'm really passionate about and I can say not only hits everybody in sales, but everybody inside an organization. And quite frankly, we don't talk a lot about it, right? Uh, you know, sure. so let me ask you, how did you sleep last night? How many hours did you get? <laughs> not enough. <laughs> not enough. The old laptop probably closed around probably like 12 and then it was up around, you know, six ish. So, you know, you got to, it's, it's part of the gig. Yeah, totally. And how, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling pretty good. How are you feeling? I'm fantastic. I'd Love say it. I got around seven and a half or so. Okay. Last Love it. Uh, and we'll talk about some of that later today, but you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I talked to, you know, I get very few answers back when I ask people about how they're feeling and how much sleep are they getting. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, uh, in a sales context, it's a conversation that we just don't have enough. Totally. Yeah. Well, it's so easy just to be like, oh, good. You know, and then you leave it at that. And it's like, is it really though? Yeah. You got you to gotta pry sometimes. You know, we're all on this journey. You know, if I go back and, you know, we'll talk about sort of where I started. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, right now, you know, we're in the end of our Q3 here at Salesforce. We're heading into Q4. And guess what? We're going to be walking around professionally. This is sort of, you know, we hire people for their brains and their yeah. mind and we lock them up and they walk around zombies. And so Q4, <laughs> all these amazing sales reps, sales leaders are going to be shuffling around the country, globally, you know, throughout all organizations. Yeah. Uh, tired looking at their screens. And uh, I'm glad we're talking about this topic. Likewise. Uh, so for me, as you mentioned, yes, I'm SVP commercial sales uh, here at Salesforce, uh, based out of San Francisco, but covered the, uh, the entire US. Um, I'm a father of three. Uh, I live just across the bridge here in Mill Valley. Um, and uh, when I'm not in the office, I'm usually on a plane somewhere uh, in a conference room, like many of the souls I just talked about. <laughs> um, but you know, if you go back a bit, uh, you know, I, I've got a non-traditional beginning relative to sales. Uh, right. you know, I'm an immigrant. My family came to the U.S. when I was nine. Uh, I'm also the youngest of nine kids. Um, and uh, when we showed up, we, we came from a rural part of Pakistan. And uh, just an amazing privilege to, to have the opportunity to be in the U.S. And really just very fortunate that my parents put me in a position where um, I could have both the opportunity for an education and, and a career 
in, in a country like the U.S. And uh, but you know when I first started, quite frankly, uh, you know m my siblings, you know, you know of, of the nine kids, seven boys. Of those four, my brothers went right into car sales along with my dad. And it really, um, you know, I had a lot of appreciation. I mean, this is the era where uh, you know it was probably the first recurring revenue business, right? Uh, <laughs> right. You, know, you bought on a relationship, and if you got it wrong once. Uh, you know, people kind of knew who you were. And so word of mouth, your relationship, uh, th those things stuck with me, quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, many, many years ago. Um, and, but it was also kind of a path, quite frankly, that I wasn't sure was right for me. Right. Uh, so, you know, I was the first in my family to go to college. I started off at a community college, University of Utah, um, and then got my break into finance. And uh, I went into investment banking in New York, private equity, uh, from there, looped into business school. Uh, that's what brought me out to the Bay Area, went to Stanford Business School, and then really kind of took a step back there, uh, quite frankly, and, and, and sort of took inventory on where I wanted to go. Uh, up until then, it was sort of just, I wanted to be at the peak of my profession and, and, and what I was doing, and banking, private equity, all these sort of notches along the way were sort of how I looked at it. But when I took a step back, the opportunity to meet some amazing people, both executives, professors, it really shifted my thinking about sales, right? The, the, the right. saying that you're either making stuff or selling stuff and somewhere between is, you know, uh, you know, overhead, call it, all key components that are really valuable. But I met some individuals that really helped me have a new framing on sales. And so that's where I said, hey, I'm going for it. And I'm going to go into uh, take a shot at a career in sales. And the best way to do it was to carry back. And so in sort of a roundabout way, here I am back in the family business of, of sales. And uh, that's when I found Salesforce uh, started as a small business rep carrying, covering the East Coast based out of San Francisco, um, shuttling back and forth as needed and uh, went from there all the way up, up through various segments. And then I was given an opportunity to be a sales leader um, yeah. here at Salesforce. And that was really where I got my first start. That's pretty, uh, pretty amazing, you know, going from uh, a nine year old with, you know, no formal education from Pakistan over to, you know, getting your MBA at, at Stanford. That's, that's amazing. And I think a lot of people can relate to kind of at least the latter half of, of that story, right? When you, you start out in your career and you're a little bit more reactive, right? You're just kind of like, okay, I want to do this. I want to do everything and whatever opportunities come at you, you kind of just, you just go for, whereas, you know, when you actually take a step back like you did and be like, okay, what do I want? And then you start becoming a little bit more proactive in, in what you seek out. And then that's how you, you landed at, at Salesforce. That's cool. Um, I got to ask you that because it is about work-life balance and that's, that's an awesome career story. What are you, what are you passionate about outside of, uh, of work? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I really care about um, one is team and culture it is something that I live it. You know, this is where I spend the biggest amount of my time. Uh, and so how do we build a culture and a team that's world-class and, and cares about the right things? And we'll talk about some of that today. Mm -hmm. but, you know, education is something that's really important to me. Um, you know, and when I look back at all areas, I've always taken, taken an active effort, uh, whether even, uh, you know, early, early days when I was uh, volunteering for junior achievement, showing up and just sharing with students in classrooms. Uh, when I think about the, the team activities that we do as a team here, we go volunteer together. Um, and, um, you know, Salesforce, for example, it certainly aligns with my values on that front. And so we adopt a school uh, and wow. we invest our time as a team and we encourage also our customers to go adopt schools. And, um, and so for me, education ha has really leveled the playing field for me and it's given me opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. and so whether it's on my personal time, investing in education causes, my wife and I at one point took some time off and volunteered for an organization that was focused on youth and on um, education. And it's something that I try to bring into what we do. Uh, you know, for example, today even, um, I was talking to one of my team members uh, in Boston, Salesforce is doing this event where uh, run literacy in Boston. And cool. You know, it's one of these areas where we can just kind of do it on our own, but you know, wouldn't it be great if we got the whole community to do it? And so this was an example where we've got our customers, we've got our partners, and we're just doing it together. And it's not a sales thing, it's just really about 
what we value in our community. And we, we encourage, quite frankly, our customers at Greenforce, we talked about it. Uh, Mark Benioff is on stage talking about this. And I, one of our customers literally showed up, went to school down the street from them and said, hey, how can I help? How can we help? And the principal had never had that before. So, so he, he took the offer and now they're just there helping to prep for back to school. Uh, they're going to try to fundraise. They've got these computers that have been, been there for 10 years, uh, which is pretty wild to think about. Wow. Um, and, but again, you know, it's one of these things that everybody can have an impact. Um, and so for me, education is, is core to where I like to spend my time. And certainly, uh, you know, the other part is well-being and fitness. And so, uh, nice. you know, it, it, it's both uh, what keeps the fuel that keeps me going, but yep. it's all toward what I'm interested in. I like it. Awesome. So education, volunteering, and, uh, and exercise, those are the kind of the fuel that allows you to keep up with your demanding uh, schedule. That's, that's awesome. Similar, similar in my world as well. Um, okay, so let's, let's dive right into it. So um, you've been, we were talking about your, your, your career track, and you've been at both large companies, Salesforce, you guys are racing towards $20 billion. Uh, so just a small company. Uh, so you've been with this, you know, behemoth, and you've also been um, at a startup in uh, a sales role. So if I'm a sales rep and I'm, I'm listening to this uh, today and maybe I'm faced with this situation where, okay, do I go and join, you know, one of these big guys or do I cut my teeth at a startup? Uh, how would you think about that trade off? Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I think it, I think it's gotta be authentic to the person and, right. and you know, go to the place, you know, I, I'm in the heart of the Valley here and it, you know, there's, you know, I, have this conversation all the time with either my team or, or people I've worked with in the past. And, you know, I think both are great opportunities, but I think with smaller companies, and when I think about when I was both a rep and then in a leadership position, you know, smaller companies are often talking about single product, uh, you know, and, you know, the part that I always uh, counsel reps on is, is that from a sales standpoint, uh, you don't get the value for taking product market risk. Uh, this right. is some, one of my old mentors, uh, Andy Rackliffe talks a lot about, teaches a class at Stanford about this, where, um, you know, there's so much that's happening along the way and you're building the infrastructure. And as a sales rep, you're certainly building the customer back into the organization. Mm -hmm. But there's so many areas that are out of your control on the product market fit. And right. so from an overall uh, scope and responsibility standpoint, uh, I don't think our sales rep, especially the, the role is that different day to day at a young company versus small mm -hmm. uh, in the context of you need to be in front of the customer. Um, you're, you're trying to close, you're building pipeline. But, you know, one of the frameworks that I, you know, I, I would counsel people to look at would be, you know, the sales learning curve. Just Google it. Mark Leslie. It's one of the hallmark articles ever written. And yeah. you know, I think there, there may be certain things where, where people, you know, you talk about sort of the three phases of a company initiation, transition, execution. Uh, and the natural arc is kind of like a manufacturing cycle. You sort of just don't go all in when you're sort of still prototyping a product. And that's kind of like sales. Uh, right. you know, there's so many companies hiring tons of reps, for example, that may not have their product market figured out. And they're just kind of off on this path. Uh, quite frankly, maybe not best position to succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, and each one of those stages has different reps. You've got this you know, idea of a renaissance rep, someone that's sort of just is kind of there, creative, doesn't need a lot of guidance, somewhere between that to this coin operator rep where you throw them in a territory, uh, essentially, and they're, you know, they know what to do, the collateral is there, the company's there. And so you take that example and you go to a bigger company, you take Salesforce, for example, right? We're certainly on the other side of it, but in each of our areas, you know, when it first started, we were largely a, you know, single product company or multi-product in the sense of maybe we had sales and service clouds and a platform, but now when you look Across the range, we're hitting every major uh, angle: sales, service, marketing, um, communities, and the full platform that you can build on. And in that example, now we've got also a number of acquisitions we've bought along that we're integrating. And each one of those, quite frankly, has its own curve. And so I think it's around, um, you know, when you think about a rep. Uh, in that example, like we have some reps that are better tuned, for example. Uh, in a certain product category and and their skill set might be where they're you know we're earlier stage in the context of helping our customers along a journey uh, even mm -hmm. the product might be mature but the customers are still early and, and that's a different motion um, yeah. 
you know, at a bigger company, uh, you know, what you're not taking as a, as a rep is uh, this product market risk. And then the other areas, right? You've got an, you get brand, you get uh, tons of resources. And, you know, when, you know, when I'm out in the field, it doesn't matter where I'm at, whether I'm talking to startup or a large company, you know, reps want a couple of things. They want to make a lot of money, usually. Uh, and not that that's the only thing they want to do, but that's often you know, one of the few things that they talk about. Yeah. They want to strive for work life balance and then they want to grow. And I think yeah. from a sales standpoint, both those areas are certainly there. Um, but you know, I think those are some of the trade-offs I would think about large versus small. Definitely. Yeah. I would agree with, you know, everything that, that you just went through there. And I think a, a point that I hear more and more from young sales professionals, you know, coming up is this, is this growth piece is I want to grow. I want to learn. I think people, you know, have, have kind of opened up to this idea that you to be successful, you're going to have to be a lifelong learner in whatever you decide to do, especially sales with, with the, the pace of innovation and process just going so fast. And I think a kind of a fallacy I hear a, a, a lot is, you know, I, I want to go to a startup because I'm going to, I'm going to learn so much. I'm going to be involved in everything. And so I'm going to learn how a, a business works and, and it's just going to, you know, exponentially help my growth. And, it does. I've been part of startups and now part of a much larger organization, but you get taught how to be resourceful because you're, you're teaching yourself. You're right. You don't have necessarily like if you're the one sales guy, you got to build out the process. You don't have anyone teaching you. So you might get your hand in a lot of these things, but I think what you're actually learning is, is how to be resourceful. Right. And not so much. Whereas when you get a big organization, you have just so many more, we call them like knowledge resources or mentors that you can lean on so that you can make sure you're actually doing it in, in the proper fashion. So it's interesting. I think you, it, it's definitely a trade off as, as you said. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But I also think in all scenarios though, uh, I think of sales as an apprenticeship model. Uh, totally. Yeah. You know, there's no better uh, way than just to do it. Right. I yeah. Mean, think about the traditional model like where I started right um, you know like in our world you come in you know a lot of a lot of people come in out of uh, out of college yeah you know, their, their SRs or you know either you know they're handling the inbound leads you have you know business development reps uh, you know who are, who are partnered with our team they're doing outbound calling and then you go up this cycle around different type you know different stages of, of companies uh, you know from small business all the way to large enterprise mm -hmm. and one of those areas quite frankly has a whole different opportunity of personal growth um, agree yeah and to ship along that whole frontier so I, I think whether you're a small or a larger company you know I, I always advise both our reps our managers myself quite frankly I, you know we're, we're continuing on that journey of apprenticeship yeah and, and if, if you think you've you really mastered it um, that's great there's the next challenge ahead of that if you want to keep going yeah. totally absolutely as soon as you think you you've mastered it then you become stagnant and then you're redundant super quick, unfortunately, or fortunately, it makes it exciting. Right. Um, awesome. So uh, let's, let's move on. So I want to ask you just uh, keep this one a little bit more, more broad. Um, and what piece of advice would you have, let's say for a, a mid-level AE uh, that are trying to take their career to that next level, uh, but are, are still trying to balance their, their life at home. That's, I think that's probably the ongoing question for a lot of us. The uh, struggle. <laughs> whether you're early or you're late in, in that cycle. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I would start with look up top first. You know, I think it's important uh, when you look at, at the organization you're at, the company and the values and the leadership. When you look around, is this, does that align with your own personal values? Or, or, and do you respect those people? Is, it, is this the, the journey you want to be on? The most important resource we all have is our time and to think about investing that time. So, so I would start with that first. And, and if, if the answer is no, maybe you need to move to a different team or yeah. maybe you need to rethink it. Um, and it's okay. You've got time to figure it out, but you know, I wouldn't quite jump ship immediately, but I think if you know that you're not on that right path, uh, you know, time is your most valuable asset. So, so I would start with that. Um, and then, you know, we've done a lot of work here. Uh, you, know, I've had, you know, Michael Gervais is, uh, you know, a person that we work with here, uh, Finding Mastery. Uh, you know, he's got some podcasts, people that are interested yeah. in. And I think he's got a couple of really interesting concepts that I've taken to heart personally. 
and, and, and our team and we're bringing it into our team and how do we approach it? I mean, one is just sort of, you know, have your own personal philosophy. What's your mantra, right? Uh, you know, for me, you know, the way I think about it for myself and, and it varies for people. You know, I talk to my team, I say, hey, hold me accountable and I'll hold you accountable. And, and mine, you know, and the way I think about it is bring your best self every day. Yeah. And um, so in, in that context, what does that mean? You know, for me, it, it, it means a few different things. And, and if one of these areas is off balance, I'm not really bringing my best self. You know, I've got a family. And so, you know, family relationships are very important. My well-being, mindfulness, that area, if I'm not being thoughtful about that. And then third is my craft. What is it that I do? And yeah. all three of those have to sync. And certainly in any given day, they may be a little bit off balance. But, but you know, if that balance goes too long, then I'm really not bringing my best self. And, and quite frankly, in this world, right, and in this context, you know, the way I, I think about it is um, you got to deeply care. And everybody cares. Anybody that's listening to this webinar and spending their time on this cares. There's a reason that they're here. And so if you care, you're going you're gonna to compete and you're going to do your best or some version of what that might mean for you. And uh, to be your best self, you got to take care of yourself. And I think this is the part we neglect, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, one is just sort of front loading a lot. You know, we're going into Q4 here very shortly, you know, bring a lot of optimism. You know, there's going to be a lot of blows that come in the way of every one of these reps uh, or sales leaders that are listening on this podcast, uh, you know, whether you're fiscal year is now or December or somewhere, you know, there are a lot of challenges coming our way. And so front load, think about where you've been successful and keep that in mind. There's a reason you've gotten so far. Um, and then the framework that, you know, um, that, that I do subscribe to, um, and sort of this was the, you know, shared with me through, you know, Michael Gervais is, you know, you control three things, uh, your mind, your body, and your craft. And a lot of times we invest a lot of resources on your craft, enablement, training, product training, a lot of times when somebody starts, uh, you know, they're hitting that. But what about the other two areas around your mind and your body? Um, and so we'll talk, you know, and we can go deeper into those. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, for me, there's a lot there. Um, and, and if you're not focusing on those two things, you're, you're kind of shortchanging your overall career path. Mm -hmm. And so how do, you, how do you personally optimize your, your mind and body? You mentioned that, you know, you're, you're into fitness. Uh, do you have a morning routine you could share or, or how, do, how do you take care of those two? Sure. I'm happy to hit it. You know, I think, you know, well, first of all, this has been a journey, you know, yeah. um, and, and I continue to wake up to this concept and improve a little bit every day. Uh, you know, when I think back when I first got my start in investment banking, you know, this is the era of the hundred hour work week and just grinding it out like crazy in private equity and looking back now saying, wow, how did I just go through that? Um, yeah. But the average person, you know, kind of the beginning of our conversation, right? I mean, the, the average person, um, myself included, you know, you, you know, oftentimes if, if you're not thinking about this, um, is you wake up and have a couple of cups of coffee and then just like, you're like drinking coffee throughout the day and you're just kind of, you know, drinking like it's water and, and mm -hmm. you're just kind of, kind of, you know, going. And if you're, um, you know, if we're, if, you know, we're all athletes, mm -hmm. um, and, and whatever that might mean to you. But if you think about that framework for a minute, um, if you're an athlete, you've got a pulled hamstring or an injury, you're going to recover. Mm -hmm. and if you don't, you're not going to be able to compete at your best. But somehow when we make that transition over to our world um, and we think about competition and how we bring it, uh, we, we don't worry about those injuries that impact on our bodies, right? And, and you right. Look at this on prolonged acute stress, um, you know, Matthew Walker, and we'll talk about some of the routines I've taken, but Matthew Walker has been really transformative for me. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a, a neuroscientist who's written a book about, uh, it's called Why We Sleep. Why We Sleep, making and, a note of that one. And, you know, I was literally texting with one of my old managers yesterday, and we've been going back and forth on this topic. And I said, how much are you sleeping? And a lot of times when you show up in a meeting with me, I'll have, I'll have some version of that conversation, because if you're not bringing... Um, your body and therefore your mind along with that, you're doing yourself a disservice. And so the biggest performance enhancer that we control right now to boost is getting ample rest and sleep. And so we're talking about a lot of that here at Salesforce. We have a week of wellness coming up. We have a lot of resources, something we talk about our on our team, but it's, it's, it's one of these like uncomfortable topics. Mm -hmm. So back to your question, what's my routine? Well, well it starts with this uh, level of discomfort I have where every night I've got to shut it off. 
you know, we, we you know, kind of to my point earlier, you know, we hire people for their minds and, and what they're capable of. And they're often walking around in these screens, the zombies, you know, looking around. Right. And so the, the routine that I subscribe to is you got to shut it off an hour before. Uh, look at the research on sleep and REM sleep and how your body recovers. Uh, you know, the quality of sleep, you know, we're, we're in sales, we're, we're oftentimes at a client dinner, we might be entertaining. Um, and so, you know, to really be able to shut it off an hour and then prepare yourself for sleep and your bed is to go to sleep. So, you know, <laughs> not, you know, not be sitting there in bed, reading on your iPhone, doing emails. It, it literally is create that separation. Yeah. Can be hard to do. Oh, it's incredibly difficult, right? Yeah. Year end, year end, when do you turn it off? Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's the uncomfortable part. And I think one is we've got to give ourselves permission to recover, mm -hmm. give ourselves permission to sleep. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> you'll, do, you'll be better on the other end. So part yeah. of the routine is shutting it down, ideally an hour before you need to actually close those eyes. Uh, very difficult. No computer time, no screen. And if you're reading, read a book, read something that you're not having to underline, um, <laughs> you know, read, read you know, something interesting. Um, and then from there, heads down, eyes closed, a slightly cooler temperature room. And that's my routine. And then when I wake up, uh, you know, mindfulness uh, and, and having a mindfulness routine is also some, one of these things I tried years and years and, and it sort of, you know, every time we have a child, uh, we've got three kids, <laughs> reset back to- I bet. <laughs> right now we're kind of on the other end of that. And so I empathize a lot of people that might be right there in some versions of those journeys. Yeah. Now, you know, I set my alarm and it's a proper alarm. I, you know, uh, at Dreamforce, we had Ariana Huffington come in this year. Uh, she's for many years and I, and I find that to be one of the more insightful sessions on, around well-being. Yeah. This concept, hey, put your phone to bed. Put your phone to bed and then go to bed. So nice. for me to take my phone out of my bedroom is a very uncomfortable thing. I've been used to having this thing right there. It's the last thing I used to look at before I went to bed and the first thing I grabbed. And now I give myself permission to focus on myself. And so in the morning, my morning mindful um, uh, mindset routine is uh, I have a traditional alarm <laughs> when that yeah. goes on. Uh, a couple of deep breaths. Uh, I have one thought around positive intention uh, and my intention for the day and one thought around uh, um, appreciation. You know, what am I grateful for? And I have those two thoughts, think about it, put my feet on the ground, and then I go and I don't go and go grab my phone. And then the question is, can I build in something around a mindfulness component of that? And so I've been doing somewhere between five to 10 minutes of a mindfulness practice. Uh, I'd like to say every morning, but you know, it's ideally most mornings. Yeah. 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 And, and there's a lot of different uh, approaches people can take. And so, you know, I'm not here to subscribe to one, but you know, yeah. even about five minutes, 10 minutes to do a guided mindfulness routine. And, and, and that's been proven uh, through science. And these are not my facts. I'm not here to give medical advice, but if you yeah. <laughs> yeah. like Matthew Walker, they'll tell you there's a lot of value there. Totally. And I do that. And so that's really around the area of uh, mindfulness thinking. And so I talked about the mind and the body, uh, you know, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to, um, work out and i'm not suggesting you know ask anybody on my team uh if i'm ever going for a run with them boy i'm definitely in the pack <laughs> but, but, but you're so, out there you're well, out there sometimes right but it's you know right. it's, it's a culture that that we can all instill as yeah. teams and so you go to any one of our off sites uh whether it's our it's a customer off site with you know at a big conference or um just a team off site there's always some component. You don't have to go, you know, run or such. You can take a walk. Uh, if, if you were at Dreamforce recently or you've been to one of our offsites, you'll see these monks walking around the monastics. And there's a guided meditation every morning. And that, cool. and that's, that is there for a reason. There are a lot of people that show up and get a lot of value from that. And, and that mm -hmm. just sense, it sets the intent. And it's a big cultural transformation. And it sort of is the culture around well-being. And so on the body, for me, at least, if, if I usually don't work out in the morning, I typically don't. And so, you know, I, I set the alarm for five uh, and I'm usually up and at it by 530 for some sort of a workout. And I get in first day, uh, first thing in the morning 
and then I spend a little bit of time with my children and my family and my wife in the morning, just getting them ready and then I'm out of the house. That's if I'm here. Now, if I'm on the road, it's a version of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, kind of, you know, try to stick to that arc. And, you know, yeah. I'm not here to give uh, advice on diets and eating, but I would just say, have a plan, have a program. And uh, David Agus, who you'll see often at Salesforce uh, areas, and you can Google him as well, and you'll find a lot. And I think he would say the most important thing in that con- in that on that frontier is just have a right routine. Think yeah. about, you know, consistency over routine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these areas around body and mind, and this is the, just the final point on this. The, yeah. What's really hard about this is, uh, this has to be a daily thing. Mm-hmm. And now the good thing is, if you miss a day, pick it up next day. Just don't put it off until next week or next week. You know, yeah. so if, you're, if you've been on a bad run for a while, that's okay. Like start today, start tomorrow. And even five minutes of mindfulness, or a quick walk, uh, getting getting up from your desk, taking a walk, you know, moving, eating, drinking plenty of water. Uh, you know, these are all small little things we can do every single day. Yeah, that's a great. I, I love that last point there too. It's like I know for myself, I used to have all these routines, and I would it would really throw me off if I just like miss like one day, and then I'd just be like grumpy and all this stuff. And I think you have to. I've learned now more just to like just forgive yourself, get over it. You know, everyone lives fluid lives, things happen. If you happen to, you know, eat unhealthy one, one lunch, or you slept in a little bit, that is okay as well. Right. It's just about Mm -hmm. building these routines and, and being as consistent as possible. Yeah. I'll I'll put it out into the world that we can all uh, acknowledge on this call. Right. We talk about prospecting. I don't care where you are, whether you're a BDR or or, or, or a rep. Yeah. Right. It's one of these things where, you know, prospecting is not an all-day activity. It's just an everyday yeah. activity. You got to do a little bit yeah. every day, and you can't. Yeah. And, and this is the thing about um, mindfulness, sleep. It's an everyday activity, and uh, you know, our bodies. Uh, you know, you you can't really bank that stuff, and so right. the only thing our bodies will bank are fat and yeah. uh, acute, acute stress. Yeah, <laughs> and carry those things for years if it's prolonged. Yeah. Uh, and so that you also have an opportunity to flush that out on a daily basis. Totally. Absolutely. And okay, so we actually have a great question from the, the audience and the community, uh, which I'm going to uh, throw your way, Adnan. Uh, Chris Philby. Um, Chris, thank you so much for the question. He wants to ask, so when you do ask your top performers, you know, how much are they sleeping? Have you actually noticed any trends in sleep behaviors between your top performers compared to your team's mid to low level performers? Is there a correlation there? The, what I see, and uh, I was having this conversation with one of our managers. Uh, it's, it's a great question. Like, like mm-hmm. how, how do you measure that on a dashboard? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's one of these things. Uh, well, well, you can measure it. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can measure it on uh, in terms yeah. of, you know, uh, we can talk about uh, ways to capture uh, metrics personally. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the consistent thing when we look at whether you're a, uh, you know, business development rep or a SDR, anywhere on that spectrum to a rep or, you know, just a professional, um, you know, pe- where people are at their finest is when they have focus and, right. and when they're on top of their game. And, and I would just argue, if you look at the data uh, around sleep, specifically around well-being, around eating well, and, and how all these things come together in mindfulness. Um, people that are coming in very focused and energized bring a different elevation of their game and, and that craft, and, and that does show up versus people that are just, you know, there are a lot of people that are very busy, uh, but are they productive? And yes, there's right. a lot of tools and technologies I believe very strongly in to help us with that, and, and we, we play a big part of that. At Salesforce, um, but that's really where it manifests itself. And versus yeah. other people just kind of going through their day a little bit numb, just kind of rolling with it, and uh, other people's priorities. And I think uh, the, the focus and the sharpness does show up, and the customers yeah. notice it as well. Mm-hmm. I would definitely, definitely agree. Um, all right, well, thank you for for that answer. That was awesome. And and Chris, hope we answered that for you. Um, so let's let's move on here. So. Again, going back to uh, some, some general advice, uh, let's, let's position it as SDRs. We just talked prospecting is a, it's one of the hardest you know, sales activities that you can do. And let's say I'm an SDR and I'm trying to develop good habits as I progress in my career. 
uh, but also want to live this balanced and, and happy life. Uh, where's the, the give and take there? Because I know a lot of these SDRs are just so hungry and they just want to, you know, get to that next level. So what advice would you have uh, for those folks? Yeah, when, when, I, when I look at our best SDRs, um, and both when I was a rep, and the SDRs that were, uh, um, you know, tagged to me and on, on, on my team, um, and when I talk to our SDR managers, they'll tell you it, it's really easy. You can tell the people that are prioritizing their day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, people that are coming in with a specific intention for the day, they set those boundaries for themselves, and then they just go. And that focus drives so much. Um, and our best SDRs, I would argue, probably have also probably the best work-life balance because they're right. prepping for the day at the end of their day. And they're thinking about the next day before they leave here. They're not having to go home as much necessarily. And we're not expecting them to go home and crank it out all night. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, right. We want people showing up to be as productive as they can and setting those boundaries and, and those objectives. And quite frankly, those behaviors are... Um, really hard to change over time. And so, you know, when I talked about the, the progression and the apprenticeship model in sales, what you're doing as an SDR now, setting those boundaries, focusing on your day, uh, you know, and if you want to get an hour back, are you spending a couple of hours, you know, grabbing coffee or are you just being productive? Because that, those hours back in your day, you get back in your evening, uh, for example. Um, so you really decide how you want to stretch that day. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we see the correlation. Got it. Tons of great, great insight uh, in there. Uh, okay, so let's transition a little bit to, to Salesforce, like actually how Salesforce thinks about some of these things because you, know, you guys are at, at the pinnacle. You've been driving this conversation forward for, for many years now. So we talked a little bit about this, but how does Salesforce think of overall well-being for their uh, you know, workers, yeah. partners, whatever we, we're calling them? Well, you know, it's... it's uh, you know, we pride ourselves on this. We, we think about our community um, and our, our, our Ohana, uh, the Hawaiian work with family, mm -hmm. uh, is, is what we call our workforce. And uh, we're growing and we're going to continue to grow. Right? We, we talk, uh, you know, we've talked about how we're at roughly 30,000 employees uh, and we're going to 60,000. Um, and, and that's something that we talk openly to the market about. Um, but the internal conversation is even the growth beyond that. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can grow is if, and continue to be successful is if our broad community is successful. So right. we have Trailhead, which is uh, uh, both part of our platform, but something that we use internally. So wh when you start internally, you have different journeys uh, that you can take. And specific to Trailhead, one of the areas that's very culturally normal, uh, the norm here um, is Camp Pono. Um, and it's kind of four key areas that's that's part of what we do and when you join and or if you're not also as part of trailhead for our, our community you know we talk about nourish uh you know are you eating well we talk about revive around well-being uh we talk about movement uh we talk about thriving and on that we have a lot of resources for our employees again it starts with the culture of, mm -hmm. of acknowledging that it's important we give people permission to do that Somebody goes on vacation, we get permission to go off and be on vacation. We don't want to hear from you in our vacation. <laughs> nice. Um, and so, so we bring that into the, the common norm. I mean, to hear sales leaders, to hear our executives walking around talking about things like well-being. Uh, you know, if you, want a, if you want a good quality FaceTime with an, uh, with a, with a, with an executive at Salesforce, uh, chances are you'll probably find them early morning somewhere at a company or a corporate offsite, and you can just catch up with them. I, mean, I started 10 years ago. When I was first here as a, as, a, as a rep, I remember just running outside one morning and running into Parker Harris, who's our co-founder, um, wow. and just running into Parker. And it was just a run along with Parker, and a bunch of us used to do that. And Sweet. I've spent more time with a lot of our executives in that context in activities like that. And so we think yeah. about that. And then kind of what I was talking about earlier, we also think about how we give back, right? And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not just physical. It's around, you know, you know, what's important to us. And um, as a community, we don't just think about um, just us. And so I talked about the Boston example today, right? Um, to, to be aligned with your customers and your partners or, around something that they care about. One, it's just, just, just good quality time. I mean, I, 
I enjoy golf as much as the next person, but boy, <laughs> they doing something like that, a lot more integrated and yep. feeling an impact. Um, so so we, we do a fair amount of that, whether it's at a partner level um, or community level or all of our team off sites, we have something called uh, VTO, volunteer time off. And so when you think about the, uh, you know, one, one, one model, the integrated uh, philanthropy uh, uh, framework that we have, uh, we ask, we, we do it and we, we encourage our community to give 1% of their time, their product uh, and capital. And on time we track it. So for my all hands every month, we're talking about this. Certainly we talk about the metrics, right? And, and how's the business doing? But we also sit down and talk about a scorecard. Uh, we, we have Ohana scorecard and that's things like volunteering. Are we volunteering? We, uh, the team that, uh, you know, my team so far has logged 1200 volunteer hours. Just wow. Yesterday. And we've got wow. to go, right? We talk about uh, Camp Puno, but, you know, which I just talked about. You know, we mm -hmm. talk about areas around well-being. We talk about equality, which is a really important uh, metric. That we look at. Yeah. We talk about, uh, and we want and uh, encourage diverse voices around the table. And those are some of just the cultural norms that are just here that we look yeah. at. That's amazing. It's, it's very much ingrained, Dave. Eh? This, uh, this isn't an afterthought for you guys at all. So it's, it's cool. And I, I'm excited to see more organizations follow suit. I think a lot, of, a, a lot are, are waking up to this idea of how important it is to you know, keep the mind and soul and body of your, your uh, organization thriving. Um, cool. So let's get even a little bit more specific. I would love to know uh, a little bit about your team. Like, what does your team look like, um, and kind of the makeup, and and what's it what's it all about? Sure, sure. Um, just just on that point around just the companies waking up, I would say the, the mm -hmm. other interesting thing this hits with uh, our team, and I think probably a lot of people on this phone. I think when you look at uh, one of the big changes there's a lot of conversation on millennials and how they're transforming the workspace and mm -hmm. how we're working how we think about the office environment um but also you know when you think about that transformation i think historically people looked to, to traditional institutions whether it was their place of worship or some other organization that sort of gave them direction on values and now if the companies where people go if the values of the organization that they're at the team yeah. Um, that they're on the leadership team. If those values aren't reflective of what this person believes in, you're not going to get their best. And quite frankly, you're not going to get them. They're going to leave you. And yeah. so I think it's here. It's not just Salesforce. I mean, if uh, you know, we certainly are focused on it. But I think when I go around and talk to customers and others, it, it is a real active topic. And definitely to our recruits, uh, when we're hiring people, it is a front. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a very important topic for them. Mm -hmm. um, your question around my team. So. Uh, I'm part of the organization here, which is called Commercial Sales at Salesforce. So in this organization, we've got, you know, it's roughly a thousand person strong organization that hits both kind of the, the whole cycle that I talked about from the SDR through uh, enterprise sales. Um, and I'm in a segment of that called uh, general business. And so uh, I've, got, you know, I've got four direct reports on average that have been here for about a decade. A lot of amazing uh, knowledge and people that have just performed and have gone through this personal growth and professional growth through Salesforce. And, and our team has, has evolved over the years, right? Uh, when you think about the cycle, of the, uh, when, it, when you just look at these leaders that have been here, um, you know, Salesforce has gone from being um, the uh, kind of the underdog, uh, you know, starting this new model around SaaS, now we call it cloud computing. Uh, that was different and going from there and disrupting a lot of the traditional incumbents to now where we have the dominant market share and we, have, we are an incumbent. And through that cycle, we've had to adjust both how we go to market, the, the, the layout of the team, mm -hmm. and, so, um, and the skill set of the team, right? And so my team is a, a prime team. Uh, they're, they're responsible for the primary customer relationship. Um, they're about 130. 30 reps and about 25 managers spread out throughout the U.S. And it's both based in some of our core hubs uh, geographically and also uh, based out of the home office. And we're really trying to go as close to the customer as we can. And in that example, they're prime. And then we also have a, a really strong, uh, we call it cloud sales. Other organizations might call it co-primes where they're product specialists because now we have such a diverse 
platform and so many different areas that we can deliver on for our customers. And then we also have to team properly in, in one, in, in a one Salesforce mindset with, with these extended teams. And they're also similar. Many are home-based, many are in offices throughout. That's awesome. And that team is, is growing very rapidly. I understand you've got uh, just a few uh, open slots on the team I hear over there. We, we, we are growing and uh, we welcome more. Uh, if anybody's listening, come find us. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's continued growth. And, uh, you know, the, the key there is along that journey, uh, we're both growing at uh, both the, the team, but also the scope that we're focusing on. You know, we're, we're doing way much more for our customers than we were before. So you think about the journeys that our customers are on, or on the business transformation. Yeah. And, um, you know, our reps, you know, I, you know, I talk about this, right? They bring, uh, you know, the mindset, they bring the grit, uh, you know, business acumen, and we bring the rest and we invest in the team. And, uh, you know, no one, no one was, uh, no one woke up one day to be an enterprise software sales account executive. <laughs> Where along that, that was my first choice when I was, when I was six years old, I knew it. I'm selling software. <laughs> that, that was, uh, yeah, my, my daughter, who's eight, uh, you know, I'm not sure when her next career fair will be, but I remember when I had my career fair, I don't think I, I showed up as an enterprise uh, account executive. But, <laughs> no, I don't think so. But, but a lot of the traits I had were potentially there early on. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, let's, let's dive into that then. Um, on, you've obviously trained, hired so many different sales professionals. Specifically on your team, what do you see, uh, what are the qualities that make someone successful um, on your team? Yeah, I think, you know, one of, this, one of the qualities of, of consistent reps um, that I see are a strong degree of empathy and mm -hmm. customer advocacy. Definitely. Customers know. I mean, customers are, you know, when they're buying our solutions or any solution, they're in some form of a, a pain um, because if it's, the, if it's just the status quo, they're not going to make a change usually, right? Um, you know, pain creates change. Uh, you know, discomfort creates growth. And so yeah. if there's there isn't some level of pain or discomfort in that in, in that equation. There's usually not much much shifting. Uh, and so high degree of empathy and customer advocacy. We talk a lot about that here uh, and for our customers. And look, we're in a business where if we're not doing our job properly, our customers just turn us off and they go right. there. And so we've got to re regain the customer and that trust consistently. And then from there, when I think about the next areas, this is you know when when I'm talking to reps. Uh, and when I'm interviewing, um, you know, certainly they've got to have the requisite performance uh, if they've been in a career. And that's the thing about sales. You can't hide from that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, top performer, how have you attained your goal? You know, we have a business club here, which is a way we celebrate our success in the top go to Hawaii. Um, this year, there's also going to be a club at, uh, in, in Italy, in Florence. Nice. So, so we really celebrate and, and put, the, put the top performers and highlight that. And mm -hmm. certainly you've got to compensate people well, but you, but you get from through that. Uh, but just because you've been a top performer doesn't mean you'll continue to be. And so some of the things I look for, right. Uh, intellectual curiosity, are you intellectually curious about the customer? Are you sitting there, you know, reading a 10 K are you watching the investor presentation? Are you listening to the earnings release? Are you truly intellectually curious about the customer and their business issues? Um, do you have strong business acumen as, on top of that? Because through that, can you connect that pain to a really commercial commercial conversation um, with an organization? And they're either, I hate to drill it down to some basics, but you're either growing uh, top line or you're cutting cost. And somewhere in that, in that equation is, is an opportunity for transformation. And then the last is grit. I look for grit, you know, uh, you know, how, what can you do? Because there's a lot coming out, you know, coming at us and you're going to get a lot of people, uh, you know, it's a very competitive market. Sales is competitive. So do you have the grit to really stick with it? And, mm -hmm. and I look for life experiences uh, or in their own professional experience where they've shown that grit where they've stuck with it. And if you have those areas, we'll bring the rest to you. We can bring the training. We bring the product to the earlier conversation, big, small company. We bring the infrastructure. We bring, bring the whole playbook. Um, and, support you along that path. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. And I find it funny, this, this idea of, you know, empathy being like the strongest uh, skill that you need to succeed in sales. And I hear it again and again. And it's, it's funny, could you think going back in your like investment banker days and, and trying to tell people that empathy was going to rule the day and in, in, a, in a short period of time, it would have probably been a quite stark kind of contrast there. But uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I would have probably been falling asleep uh, if I go back to the <laughs> days after my <laughs> week. I would have been just. <laughs> um, all right, so so you, those are the the skills that make your team successful, and then there's other things you know as a as a leader that you have to do to set your team up for success, and one of them is you know setting up goals. So how do you approach that for yourself and then your team? Yeah, I think there it's um, one, one is process. And the other is measure of time. So I think about it in three categories. So on that first point, our measure of time daily, right? This goes back to the conversation, bring your best self every day, right? We, yeah. we talked about this, right? Bring you, you, your mind, your body, and your craft. And at least your mind and body, you control it on a daily basis and focus on things you control and you bring that. Mm -hmm. The next increment of time I think about is monthly. You know, for us here, we talk about, you know, at Salesforce, let's say uh, we, we have 12 quarters, uh, you know, and so you have 12 opportunities to <laughs> go and, and build your full year. And yeah. in that way, you know, we have, you know, we set monthly goals. We have a monthly yeah. readout of the business. Uh, we're certainly focused annually uh, in terms of how we think about the, the, the arc of the year and the annual, you know, club attainment and such. That's really where it hits. Yeah, uh, on a basis, but we have 12 opportunities to show up and show that we can continue to advocate and make change. And, you know, I have these 12 opportunities in front of our team and we talk about all these areas. I mentioned it earlier, right? We not only do we talk about the metrics of the business, the progress we're making, but areas around well-being and diversity and equality. And then um, on a more traditional quarterly annual basis, we've aspired to a model called the V2 Mom. Okay. Um, some people have heard about it. We uh, I love it. Both it helps me focus. It keeps us organized as a company, and it's something that we publish. And uh, V two Mom stands for vision, values, methods, goals, and measures. I'll go through that. But it's one of these things. That literally, he posted. Uh, Mark Benioff, our CEO, posts his V two Mom, and cool. everyone can see it. People can comment on it. Uh, our leadership posts theirs. I'm in the process right now of updating mine. We, we, we're, we try to update it quarterly, at least semi-annually. And we have, I, I've, I've got a draft. I'm sharing it with the group and we're sharing it out with a broader team. And I'm gonna ask them just to hack this thing. Because if they don't believe it, it's one thing if I just throw it out there, but if they're not believing it and carrying that torch, it's got no shot, right? Right. And so that V2 mom process, right? The vision, you know, what's your bold vision and what you wanna achieve? Uh, you know, it starts with that and the values, what values come to mind and the principles that are gonna help you achieve that vision. And then the methods are very specific. These are the actions that you need to take <clears throat> to achieve on that vision. And the obstacles are everything that, that gets in the way or, or things that we think could get in the way. And we highlight all of those. And then we measure against that. And how are we hitting those methods? How are we hitting those obstacles? And how are we measuring the outcomes? And, and we run that through and my directs have it down to the individual account executive has their own. And theirs, their, theirs will generally probably, hopefully if, since we've gone through the process of hacking it together, there should be some alignment around the vision, but you know, their methods would be very different depending on which territory and market they're in and what they're trying to do uh, relative to me. Right. I, I like that, that V2 mom is, uh, I haven't actually heard of that, but I, I like it. How, because I'm sure you've used different business strategies in, in past lives, past uh, jobs. Uh, how does it, how does it differ? Like the, the impact of this V2 mom strategy that you, that uh, you guys have adopted? Yeah, I think, um, yeah. I mean, one is uh, having a process. Um, two, this doesn't just get done and put away to the side. This is a living, this is a living document. It's a living framework and we're measuring it and we're reviving it. And when we're, when we're faced with a decision, we go back to the V2 model. Mm -hmm. so we're thinking about a tough decision. Do we go a certain way? Um, and it's just integrated. It's just, we just do it. And it's really the North Star. And quite frankly, it, it, it begins a conversation. One of the things we'll do with our customers is when we're having 
uh, I think every rep can relate, you get into a process and you find that your customers have no organizational alignment. Um, yeah. This part of the organization is over here, somebody's over here, the executives think one thing, and there's a big, big gap. And we often, op we get our customers together and we actually put them through this VT, V2 mom exercise because they ask for it. And we have a framework to put them through it and it just, the, the most amazing things happen. You hear them actually talking to each other uh, about the real issues that oftentimes just kind of get hid and swept under various uh, you know, parts of the organization. And I think that's what's unique about the V2 mom process for us and the fact that we've also taken up to our customers. Yeah. I like that. And we've got about five more, five more minutes here. Uh, I wish I could steal you all day and just keep these rolling because I've got a page full of notes here right now <laughs> my, myself. So I love it. Um, okay. So if someone, let's say, wanted to get hired on your team today, what should I be doing to stand out? Because there's, there's one thing, maybe I have all the characteristics. That's awesome. But how do you stand out? This world is so crowded. Everyone's fighting for attention. Uh, what should someone do? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, apply, please go online. Apply. You're not going to come knock on my door. <laughs> uh, we, we will, and we will do that too. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we've got the most amazing uh, team uh, on recruiting and uh, employee success. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we take it very seriously. Uh, mm -hmm. So apply. Secondly, uh, do your homework. It's, you know, we are a, uh, you know, we're, we're an organization and a set of solutions that anybody can use. You know, nobody ever taught you or I how to, how to do a Google search or search on Amazon. And Salesforce is kind of built on that same premise. And so most likely you've either used our solutions or you're, or you're using our solutions. Or, you know, we have a lot of our solutions that are also, you know, like collaboration cloud from Quip and Chatter and certainly some of our core clouds around sales and marketing the platform. So give yourself an opportunity to really experience those solutions. Yeah. Um, we'll go talk to one of our customers uh, and, and sort of understand one of their journeys. And then I, I would just say network with our team. Our, our team wants to talk to you. Just, you know, you, you go and you see, you know, we're 30,000 strong as a company and, and growing fast. Um, there's an opportunity for your network uh, with our organizations. And if you, if you don't have somebody in your network, we, we, are, we are trying to be everywhere in a community through an organization one way or the other. Come, come to one of our events, come volunteer with us. Seriously, come get to know us uh, and spend time alongside our teams. That's what I would advise. Yeah, that's all, all great, great advice. And uh, the piece around just throw yourself in the mix. Yeah, get to, get to know some people. I think that, that's always helped me when I've taken next steps in, in my, my career. Uh, okay, so we've got three minutes. I want to use the last three minutes. We have some great questions uh, from the community. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. Um, this is from Jesus Morales. Uh, Jesus, thanks for the question. Um, how do you manage your time specifically when you have clients with different time zones and they need answers very quickly um, and it's throwing a wrench in his work-life balance? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's a challenge. Very. Uh, I think one of the, I mean, first of all, um, you got to make sure you have the right tools. I mean, make yourself efficient. I mean, mm -hmm. so many times when we have these conversations, people are living in spreadsheets and other notes and everywhere else. It's like, what actually happened? Mm -hmm. Most, a, lot of, a lot of people spend endless amounts of time just getting to the bottom root cause of the problem. So efficiency is paramount. Um, you know, customers will often forgive you for uh, the issue. They won't forgive you for how you treated them during that process. And so if a customer has to re-explain the problem to me or to our organization, we've already let them down. Yeah. So... One is just having a central view and understanding of the problem. And, and you've got to use technology and tools. There's just way too much swirling around. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is the way we come across is really, we try to have teams locally in market. You're right, Jesus. Uh, you know, for us, we're not, well, we're headquartered out of San Francisco. We're not a San Francisco company. And so we put our resources and our people in market closest to the customer. And that's one way to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. And then the last thing I would say with, with that is just, like you mentioned earlier is like just you have to set the boundaries at some point right and through things like automation you can get a quick response out and just let them know that you'll be following up in six hours or, or when you wake up exactly yeah exactly. Uh, okay i'm gonna sneak one more in here um all right this is from uh, uh sudahindra uh, sudahindra uh hopefully i'm pronouncing your name right thank you so much for the question um i have eight years of experience in sales 
uh, through retail, e-commerce, uh, service sales, uh, and most organizations tell me I'm not aggressive enough to be in sales. Um, and she's kind of going through job hunts right now. And she's confused whether sticking in sales, pre-sales, or perhaps, perhaps proposal support roles. Uh, do you have any suggestions of a career path? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, Suda, thanks for that question. Uh, uh, if, if you're thinking about your career journey, come give us a look. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think, you know, it, it, that's got to be authentic to who you are. Uh, yeah. Whether you're in sales, support, some other part of the organization, it's got to be authentic. I think for me, when I hear something like you're not aggressive enough in, in sales, I don't think sales is about aggression. Mm-hmm. Uh, the things that we've talked about are on empathy. No, no customer wants an aggressive rep. <laughs> no way. No. Rep. That just is, you know, I want someone that wants to bring their best self yeah. and we're competitive, but there's different ways on how that manifests itself. And so um, I would encourage you to maybe dive a little bit deeper around, you know, as I talked about earlier, you control your mind, your body, and your craft. Are you focusing on those top two things you can control? Um, and the way you show up with your customer and empathy and continue to do those my experiences the rest comes along with it uh but boy don't uh you know don't don't go aggressive on your customers and definitely not internally it often doesn't serve you well yeah definitely agree all right well that is our time uh, unfortunately and then i've really really uh, enjoyed this conversation and so just one more time so i know you guys you guys are growing 2x it's crazy that you're going to go from 30,000 to 60,000 um, if I am looking at, you know, throwing my hat in the ring to join the Salesforce Ohana, uh, what's the best way to do that? Uh, go to our career site um, and apply. That is the quickest, easiest, and I think we'll put a link on this podcast as well. Perfect. Um, and there are a ton of roles. And secondly, network. Just talk yep. to our Ohana, talk to our, talk to our customers, talk to our partners. We have an amazing partner ecosystem and start that conversation. Come to one of our career fairs. We have many of those throughout the country. And we'll Perfect. Awesome. Well, Adnan, I thank you again so much for your, your insight and your time today. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, for everyone who joined us, thanks so much. Thanks, Scott. Next time we talk, I'm going to ask you how much sleep did you get? Uh, okay. Uh, it'll be more than six this time. I promise. <laughs> okay. See ya.